scripture passage for this morning is from 2 Peter, chapter 3, verses 14 to 18. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, speaking of this as he does in all his letters. There are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, since you are forewarned, beware that you are not carried away with the error of the lawless and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we take this time out this morning to hear your word, I ask that either because of me or in spite of me that you bring a message to your people. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Some of you may recall a few weeks ago, I got up to preach, and I sort of threw Pastor Trish under the bus and said she gave me the most difficult sermon and then left. So she felt so guilty about this that she wrote my sermon for this morning. And it goes like this. Jesus was born. Jesus taught some stuff, healed some people. Jesus died. Jesus was raised. Jesus will come again. In the meantime, be the church. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Short, sweet, she figured everybody would be happy to get out of here. But I just, I, you know, I couldn't let it go with that. So I had to take it a little bit farther. Um, we are in the midst of a sermon series and looking at reading the Bible for all it's worth. And uh, Pastor Trish did a great job on the Old Testament last week. And this week, I have the New Testament to be able to share with you. So before we dive into the New Testament, I want us to understand a few very important concepts about Scripture that we must know before fully diving into the Bible as a whole. The Bible is not a book as much as it is a library. There's 66 books in the Bible by different authors, by different authors. It's not just one book, but it's a, it contains many, many different books within it. It is a library. Within that library, Scripture offers a variety of different genres, ranging from law and history to story, poetry, and prophecy. In and of itself, it is not the Word of God. Okay, I'll take that back a little bit. Listen to me in this. John 1 reminds us that Jesus is the Word of God, right? Scripture becomes God's Word for us as God chooses to reveal Himself in our reading of it. So the power of Scripture is not as much in this physical book that you're holding, but in God's ability to reveal God's self through the Scriptures. So it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is Jesus Christ. Always remember that. And four, what Scripture is, is a statement of belief. It's a creed. It's an expression of conviction. It's a collection of books from various people just like us, explaining and conveying their experience and understanding of God and faith and how to live it out. So if we understand the Bible in this way, okay, how many of you have a Reader's Digest book somewhere at home that has multiple volumes in it, right? They have different authors, they're different stories. It's all in one book, but it's different stories. A lot of times we look at the Bible and we assume that it's one book. And we try and go through like it's the same author writing all the way through, and then we get confused by the changes and everything that take place in that. So if we understand it as a collection, a library of different books, 66 different books by a variety of different authors written in different genres and forms, then we don't get 
we don't get hung up when things change on us a little bit. So I wanted to start this morning with that, just so we have that clear understanding about the Bible and how to look at it as a whole. So now, let's take a look at the New Testament. So I'll ask you if you brought your Bible to take it out. If you didn't, there should be a pew Bible in there. So grab a red pew Bible. And I want you to find the beginning of the book of Matthew. Uh, as I tell my youth and kids in Sunday school, it's on the right side of the Bible. So the left side's the Old Testament, right side's the New Testament. So in the right side of the Bible, find the beginning of the book of Matthew. Everybody found it? All right. So, very good. So hold that spot. And now find the end of the book of Revelation all the way to the right. Okay? And pinch between those two. That's the New Testament. Right there. And if you compare it, if you compare it to the rest of the Bible, it's roughly about a quarter a quarter of the entire scripture. In the Old Testament, there's about 23,145 verses. In the New Testament, there's about 7,958 verses. So you can take a look just from there and see how much of the Bible the New Testament actually takes up. As we get started, there's a couple of things that the New Testament, that the New Testament is not. Let's clear those up real quick. It is not a replacement for the Old Testament. It is a continuation of our faith story. In fact, the early church saw the Old Testament as bearing witness to Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us also that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. I think by having the names old and new, it gives us a false impression of it sometimes. I think we should change the name from old to original. Doesn't that sound a little bit better? Instead of it being the Old Testament, it's the original Testament because it's still a part and the basis for our faith story. It's not just something old that we discard. It's actually something that completes the story along with the New Testament. So for the rest of the sermon, I'll be calling it the original Testament as opposed to the Old Testament. Number two, it is not a collection of hugely debated texts chosen by a small majority to the exclusion of all others, as has sometimes been suggested in recent times. To understand this, we need to look at its canonization, how the Bible was actually canonized. Most of the books we have today were easily accepted. While a couple of the books were debated, 20 of the 27 books now in our New Testament were clearly accepted by the year 180 AD. Athanasius, as the Bishop of Alexandria, Alexandria listed the 27 books in 367 AD, and the final list of our currently accepted 27 books was formalized in 397 AD at the Council of Carthage. A lot of thought went into the creation of the New Testament, which can be seen in the way it parallels the Old Testament in its structure. And I want to show that to you now. Can we put the slide up? One of the books that I found really helpful in understanding the New Testament is by a Methodist pastor named Adam Hamilton, who wrote a book called Making Sense of the Bible. And I'll be sharing a couple quotes out of here uh, for you because he explains it so well, why recreate the wheel? So as you can see, this is the structure of the Old Testament, and this is the structure of the New Testament. Listen to how they parallel. Let's compare the organization of the Old Testament to the New Testament. The New Testament begins with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The stories of Jesus Christ, the New Covenant, and His commands. This parallels the Torah, and just as the Torah tells Israel's defining story, the Gospels tell Christianity's defining story. Next comes the Acts of the Apostles, the story of the early church. 
It encompasses the period from Christ's ascension to, in, to heaven in AD 30 to around AD 65, when Paul is under arrest, awaiting the trial in Rome that would lead to his death. This is a much shorter history than the historical books of the Old Testament, or original Testament, but it is similar in its attempt to tell Christianity's early history. Next come the New Testament writings, the letters from the apostles reflecting upon the meaning of faith in Christ and the living of that faith. We might think of this as mirroring the wisdom literature in the writings of the Old Testament. Finally, the New Testament ends with the book of Revelation, a book that, like the prophets of the Old Testament, challenged the early Christians to remain faithful to God, warns of impending judgment, and offers hope for those who endure to the end. So if the Gospels are the defining story of our faith, just as the five books of Moses were the defining story of the Hebrew people's faith, then how are we to understand them even more? What does it say for us that becomes our defining story? In each of the Gospels, Jesus reveals the heart and character of God. He demonstrates God's frustration with religious hypocrisy, God's compassion for those who are poor and oppressed, God's mercy toward those who sin, God's healing power for those who are broken. He calls human beings into right relationship with God, commands them above all else to love God and neighbor, commands them above all else to love God and neighbor, and insists that this love includes compassion for the hungry and forgiveness for those who sin against us. He even demands that we apply this love to our enemies. From a Christian perspective, his trial is an indictment of the human race. His death, a judgment upon human, humanity's sin, and a means of revealing God's will, God's grace, and God's love. His resurrection demonstrates God's triumph over sin, evil, hopelessness, despair, and ultimately death. After his resurrection, he sends his disciples into the world to announce his kingdom and to lead a revolution that would put the world right. That is the gospel story. So the gospel is the defining story for us. It's the story of Jesus Christ. It's the story of God's love for us that would bring Jesus Christ, God's word made flesh to each and every one of us. It is our defining story and who we are meant to be as Christian people, worshiping a God who commands two things of us, to love God and to love our neighbor. While the book of Acts tells the history of the early church and how Paul becomes the most powerful evangelist the church has ever known, the epistles are helpful as instruction on how to be faithful people and a faithful church. It's instructions to the churches, it's instructions to people serving the churches to be a faithful people. Each letter was written to either a church or a person that was in need of help and instruction on how to understand Christ and live out their faith. So we look at the, the, the yeah, I'm sorry. We look at the Gospels as a way of finding out our defining story. Who was Jesus Christ? Who was God? What was God doing in the midst of Christ? What was Christ teaching us about God and our understanding of Scripture? We look to the epistles as people that are struggling to follow this God and come to know it more to receive instruction and guidance in how to be a church and how to be a faithful person in the church. Then we look at the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation truly needs a study and a sermon all to itself. We're not going to be able to tackle that all today or it would take up the rest of the afternoon. It encourages us, though, to be faithful. This is what we need to understand for it, from it. It encourages us to be faithful and warns us of the dangers of not living faithfully. But the most important message in the book of Revelation for us is that in the end, God is victorious. And we as a faithful people live with God for eternity. Just like the, the books of the prophets in the Old Testament warning of unfaithfulness and the dangers of that and 
the, uh, the trials that would come as a result, the book of Revelation does the same for us. It warns us that if we're not faithful and we're not following God, that problems are going to come. But again, the good news is that in the end, God wins. And because God wins, we win also. So in a nutshell, this is the New Testament for all of us. It is the story of Jesus, and along with the original Testament, it is our faith story of God's love for all creation. There is one very unique thing that the New Testament does for us. While it does not rewrite the scriptures of the original Testament, it does give us a new lens through which to view and understand them. Jesus is our greatest revelation of the heart and the character of God. To find God throughout the Bible, we must view it in relation to our knowledge of Jesus Christ as found in the New Testament. Do you get that? Jesus is the greatest revelation of who God is for us. When Jesus was challenging the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the temple priests, he often would say, you've heard it say, you've heard it said, but I tell you. He challenged things. He didn't follow the law to the letter. He allowed his disciples to eat on the Sabbath day. He healed people on the Sabbath day. You weren't supposed to do that. So he was showing a different understanding of God's love and God's grace and everything else. So for us to completely understand scripture, Jesus, through God, has given us a better lens through which to understand that. So the New Testament does not replace it. It gives us a lens through which to view the whole story and understand where God is in the midst of that. We have to understand this. We have to understand this. We have to know that Christ is the best revelation for God that we have. I would like to close today by sharing three passages from the New Testament that I hope will help you in your reading and understanding of it for all that it's worth. The first is from 2 Timothy 3.16. And it reads this way. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. John 1 reads this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Luke chapter 1 says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that had been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Scripture is necessary for us. The New Testament is necessary for us to come to a greater understanding of who God is. Jesus gives us that great revelation. Let the story of Scripture, both Original Testament and New Testament, become your story so that you can become even more a part of God's story. Amen? Amen.